Are you tired of watching the same videos on boring planes like P-51s, F-18s, or 747s? Boring! So am I. So let's check out these five planes I guarantee you won't get bored with. Number five, the flying watermelon, the flying football. Yep, the poor Arava was the recipient of many nicknames over the years. So what's the story behind this goofy looking plane? The Arava was developed in the late 1960s by Israeli Aircraft Industries. Up to that point, Israel manufacturers had been producing carbon copies of American and French designs, such as the Dassault Mirage. So the company decided to work on their very first design. Named the Arava, it was built for superb performance on short runways, with the goal of carrying large loads into small airstrips. And it certainly does look the part. A portly short takeoff and landing aircraft, it competed roughly in the same segment as the Twin Otter from Canada and the short sky van from Ireland. Another chubby design too. The Arava was influenced by the Nord Neuratlas from France, a plane already being used in Israel. Unlike the heavy Neuratlas, the Arava was much smaller and shorter. Instead of a retractable gear, it had a rugged fixed landing gear, which would help keep the design simple, lower cost, and better suited for bumpy runways. With the tail separated from the fuselage, loading the plane up was a breeze. You could crack the fuselage open and toss in anything wide enough to fit inside. This design feature was a nod to another chubby design, the Miles Aerovan. The Arava was powered by reliable Pratt & Whitney PT6 turboprops with 750 horsepower, giving it plenty of power, if not speed. It could carry up to 20 passengers or up to 5,000 pounds of cargo. Israeli Aircraft Industries was optimistic and projected to sell between 400 to 600 Aravas to the civilian market. Maybe because of its looks or maybe because it just looks slow, no one seemed interested in the Arava. It certainly didn't help that one of the prototypes crashed. Even the Israeli Air Force had no interest in the poor plane. At that point, the whole program was in danger of getting cancelled by the Israeli government. Eventually, the Arava sold in Central and South America, where it felt at home on rough airstrips and its wide fuselage was found quite useful. Israeli aircraft industries then tried to market the plane as a 19-seat passenger plane, but the Arava lost out to the Bondurante and Metroliner, which were much faster on the same horsepower, and looked a lot better too. Curiously, the Arava could be equipped as a ground attack aircraft, complete with machine guns or rocket pods. It doesn't seem like any were used this way though. A total of about 90 Aravas were sold. Number 4. The Jamburu is a success story from Australia, producing hundreds of aircraft between factory built light sport planes and kit planes. Jamburu also produces engines, which power both their own planes and hundreds of other kit planes around the world. So with that kind of track record, why in the world would they come up with such a strange design like the Jamburu twin? With twin engines sprouting from its nose like skin tags, the Jabiru twin bears a little resemblance to the Dornier 28, which also carries its twin engines on its nose. The idea for the twin was conceived in South Africa. The story goes that many bush pilots wanted to fly a Jabiru for remote missions above farmlands and jungles, but didn't want to contend with angry farmers yielding AK-47s. Legend also has it that those same farmers would demand ransom from those who landed on their farms. In order to save pilots from these headaches, a cheap solution would need to be devised. And that solution was to graft twin engines onto the Jabiru Model 430. The folks back in headquarters in Australia turned down the idea, as it would demand a major redesign of the wings and fuselage. So, their South Africa office took up the slack and came up with a solution Dornier would have been proud of in mounting both engines on the nose. Jabiru Australia contributed with the molds and using a J430 model as their foundation, built a special nose bowl that could be easily retrofitted on any J430 with minimal mods required to the rest of the plane. Everything seems pretty well thought out, even with a mesh hole in the canard mounts so they don't provide any lift. For a twin, performance isn't exactly dazzling, but you can't ask for too much with only 80 horsepower and fixed pitch propeller. But if all you need is to limp back home in one engine while flying over hostile territory, the Jabiru twin just might fit the bill. And who knows, maybe even keep you at a safe distance from those pesky AK-47s. At this time, the twin has been certified in South Africa, not sure if any have been sold. Number 3. The Miles Aerovan If judged by the law of physics, one would think the Aerovan would never fly. Looking like a boxcar with wings, you'd think they would power this thing with V12s. And yet, 
Somehow it did fly, even with its puny engines with only 145 horsepower each. And not only did it fly, it managed to carry payloads higher than its own empty weight. The Aerovan was one of the last designs produced by Miles Aircraft before the end of World War II. It was marketed to the British government as a tactical transport, which it probably would have been great at, and also meaning there could have been hundreds of Aerovans built to support the war effort. The problem was Miles Aircraft had not asked the British government for permission to build this lovely aircraft. As punishment, Miles was ordered to halt production till further notice. Once the war in Europe ended, Miles was finally allowed to churn out more Aerovans. By now, customers were beating down their door and the company had no means to produce enough airplanes to satisfy the demand. What was so special about this chubby plane? For starters, the cabin was huge. You could fit either 10 passengers inside or cram it with around 2,000 pounds of cargo. An average sized car could be flown inside as well. Let's not forget this thing only had 145 horsepower. To make best use of the huge cabin, clamshell doors allowed it to swallow up almost anything that could fit inside. Surprisingly, it was flown by a single pilot. And also surprisingly, pilots were delighted at how well this thing flew, even on such little power. While the Aerovan looked promising, Miles Aircraft was an ambitious company and their imagination flew wild. The Aerovan was spun off into a dizzying array of versions. Seaplane, observation plane, a version with four engines, and even a version with a detachable pod fuselage. Another one served as a test bed for huge turboprops, and what might have been the strangest modification was an Aerovan with long, skinny wings. This would be later put to use by the French on the Harel Dubois HD-34. Sadly, Miles aircraft were bogged down in a political scandal and after several lawsuits against them, shut their doors in 1948 and thus ending everyone's dream of owning the ultimate flying moving van. By the time they went bankrupt, only 48 were sold. Number 2. Here we have a sad looking plane with an equally sad story behind it. The Patch and Explorer. Who would design such a monstrosity? The Explorer was actually born as an amphibian. The Thurston Teal was a nice and likable amphibian from the 1960s, somewhat similar to a lake amphibian, but with a T-tail and a forward-facing engine. Unlike the lake amphibian, not many were built, so Thurston decided to try their hand at something a bit different. Thurston took the Teal to the chop shop and it morphed into a land plane. Thurston's game plan was to sell it as a cheap alternative to helicopters, where it could be used for pipeline patrol, for example. It was almost as slow as a chopper and it had a huge glassy cockpit to match. Thurston found no buyers in the US, so he packed his bags and headed to South Africa. He partnered up with a local investor and tried to whip up some interest and start up production. That too fizzled out. So, the poor explorer was then handed over to the South African Air Force. The Air Force tested it out as a potential observation plane, but it lost out to the AM3 Bosbach. And let's be honest, what pilot would want to be seen in the dumpy explorer when you could look cool and fly the Bosbach? The Air Force reluctantly kept the explorer and flew the thing around for flight testing. And soon, they learned of its horrible flying qualities. With the engine mounted up so high, the center of gravity was also high and made it very tricky to maneuver, especially when gusty. Because of the square, box-like fuselage, it required lots of control force to horse the plane around. And because of the seating position was so low to the ground, many pilots busted the nose gear after flaring too high on landing. Test pilots claimed exhaustion after long flights, having to wrestle the plane around. The Explorer sat abandoned in a hangar for many years, until it was restored by the Air Force Museum. For years, it flew at many air shows where it was displayed like a freak show at a circus. Sadly, it met its demise along with two pilots in 2021 following an engine failure. Number 1. Are you ready for a big fat dose of bizarre? Introducing the Stark AS-37, a biplane, but not really a biplane. The Stark AS-37 featured a wing design that was so out of the box that it would probably make Bert Rutan green with envy. André Stark was a relatively unknown designer from France. Over the course of his career, he designed a handful of elegant light planes that looked pretty ordinary compared to other aircraft. That all changed in 1938, when quietly he built a small sports plane called the AS-20. It looked pretty average in shape, except for one obvious detail the staggered wings. This was nothing like a biplane. In fact, there was nothing else that resembled this plane at all. 
The AS-20 was built during German occupation, and though it flew with several flights, the Germans really didn't think much of the little plane, and sadly, it faded into oblivion after the war. Fast forward to the 1970s, and Andre Stark rolled out a tiny racer, the AS-27 Starkey. The Starkey featured similar wings as the AS-20, but this time, the ends of the wings were connected with devices called curtains, which were essentially ailerons tilted at an angle. What exactly was Andre Stark going for with such a strange layout? Well, in order to fly slow, many airplanes employ slotted wings. Slotted wings essentially increase the wings area, giving it better handling and lower speeds. This can consist of flaps and leading edge slats. The Helio Courier is a prime example of a light plane with slotted wings that employs lots of different mechanisms. Stark's design does away with all that, and by having the wings close together, they act the same as slotted wings, but doing away with all the flap mechanisms and all the internal equipment needed to make them work. Sadly, only one Starkey was built. Andre was focused on an even better version, and definitely the most bizarre. The AS-37 was a two-seat home-built plane. It had the same staggered wings as the previous designs, but what really set this one apart was the power. Just like the Wright Flyer 70 years before it, the AS-37 had one engine in the fuselage that drove twin propellers using belt drives. The props were attached in a narrow gap between the front and back wings. So I think we can agree that Stark was an out-of-the-box kind of thinker, and this really became evident when it came time to pick an engine. Andre could have opted for an off-the-shelf Continental or Lycoming Flat 4, but why would he do something boring like that? Instead, he picked an engine from a Citroen GS. With only 60 horsepower, it was dirt cheap, and it also sipped fuel. And yet, the AS-37 still managed to haul two passengers around, just not very fast. Stark felt his little airplane was a bit underpowered, so he built another version, but this time sporting a Porsche engine with 100 horsepower. Always tweaking and trying out new things, this time the props were mounted in front of the wings. It's believed around 20 AS-37 plans were sold to home builders, but only two were built. And sadly, none of them are flying any longer. Both surviving airframes can be found in museums in France. Thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed that, and I highly suggest you check out my next video on this other amazing airplane.